On this Monday night, desperation in Gaza. Oh. The scramble for dwindling supplies, the hospitals overwhelmed by Israel's siege, and the Canadians trying to help. All the time, we would just see civilians coming in and out, either coming in injured or out in body bags. Israel under pressure as President Biden cautions it could make a big mistake. Aggressive maneuvers, a Chinese fighter jet's brazen intercept of a Canadian forces plane. Our Nitu Garcha was on board. It is within a few meters of the wing. Plus, seeking sanctuary, the small church in Gaza welcoming Palestinians trying to find protection. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The Israeli siege of Gaza is making conditions more dire by the hour. And for a second day, promises a border crossing would open to allow in humanitarian aid failed to happen. Civilians who cannot escape Gaza now caught in this siege for nine days. Israel has not begun its land invasion, but its airstrikes and its siege, cutting off food, power, water and medical supplies, is killing people. The Gaza Health Ministry says more than 2,700 700 people have died, almost 10,000 are injured. Gaza, the UN says, is being strangled. The World Health Organization says the lives of more than 3,500 patients in 35 hospitals in Gaza are at immediate risk and called for the unobstructed access of humanitarian aid. At the Rafah border crossing into Egypt today, no one got out and none of the trucks on the Egyptian side filled with humanitarian aid got in. Israel has vowed to wipe out Hamas, the Islamist group that controls Gaza and which brutally killed 1,400 Israelis, wiping out entire families, burning their homes and taking hostages. We have complete coverage tonight on events in Washington, Ottawa, Israel and Gaza. We begin tonight with Jeff Semple in Jerusalem. Jeff. Donna, the UN, the World Health Organization, and practically every major aid organization in this region are sounding the alarm tonight. Gaza is out of time. Gaza's healthcare system is on the verge of collapse. It's falling apart uh, in every uh, kind of junction in, in the system. The UN warns in the coming hours, hospitals in Gaza will run out of fuel. They're also dangerously low on water, medicine, even staff. In total, Israel has killed 14 doctors and 13 nurses. The staff, a lot of them have lost their homes, a lot of them have lost family members. Dr. Hassan Abusita told Global News the water pressure in his hospital is so low they can no longer sterilize their equipment. Israel said Sunday it was restarting the supply of water, but only to southern Gaza. Have you heard anything about uh, whether that the water has been restored or something? No. I I'm drinking like some kind of salty water from a well right now. This Canadian and his family are trapped in Gaza. He's volunteering at a hospital where he's witnessed horrific scenes. Today in the Khan Yunus hospital where I'm at right now, uh, a child was overlooking their dead parents and telling them, hey, mom and dad, let's go back home. You know, I'm ready. Why are you still asleep? And that poor child doesn't know that. He's not going to have a mom to take care of anymore or a father to raise. His family followed Israel's evacuation order last week, leaving their home in northern Gaza to head south and avoid becoming caught in gun battles from Israel's imminent ground invasion. Even in the south, he says, they're still being bombed, and now they're stuck along with thousands of others near the Egyptian border. No one getting out and no aid getting in. 80% of Gazans before this crisis were dependent on aid. Uh, we can assume that 100% of the population will need this aid is in dire need of water, of fuel, of food. Hundreds of tons of aid and supplies are stuck on the Egyptian side of the border. Egypt and aid groups blaming Israeli airstrikes. So Israel can open the border tomorrow and can allow relief. And that's primarily is the Israeli responsibility. In response to calls for a ceasefire, Israel's prime minister's office published this terse statement. There is currently no ceasefire and humanitarian aid in the Gaza Strip in exchange for the expulsion of foreigners. The UN agency responsible for Palestinian refugees also said it had received reports that Hamas had seized humanitarian supplies from a UN compound in Gaza City. After publishing that statement on its website and on social media, the UN agency then deleted the post. They wouldn't say why, but in Gaza, 
speaking out against Hamas can be deadly. Donna? All right, Jeff Semple in Jerusalem, thanks. It is Palestinians who live in Gaza, but Israel controls almost everything and everyone who goes in and out. The Rafah Gate is the only lifeline now. It's at the southernmost end of Gaza and borders Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, a desert. The only other way out is the Erez Crossing in the north, controlled by Israel, and Kerem Shalom in the south, though it's used solely for commercial goods. Both are shut. Rafa is where most Palestinians try to get permission to exit, but Egypt tightly controls it, and approval is difficult. Most people born in Gaza have never left. A Canadian-born artillery officer is helping plan Israel's ground offensive into Gaza. Crystal Gamansing is in Jerusalem and has been speaking with her. Crystal. Donna Maya told me that she rushed back to Israel. She was on vacation in Canada when that deadly incursion by Hamas took place on October 7th. Right now, she describes her work as very intense as she's helping to craft Israel's ground offensive, work that puts the lives of soldiers and civilians in her hands. A buildup of troops and tanks can be seen outside Gaza as Israel readies itself for a military operation officials claim will eliminate Hamas. We are focused on one goal, to get forces and go forward to victory. For this purpose, we will need determination, says Benjamin Netanyahu. Addressing the Knesset, the Israeli prime minister told parliamentarians victory will take time. Around Israel, military hardware is on the move. Several days have passed since the nation warned the world it would be launching coordinated attacks, including a significant ground operation. There's a lot of people that I haven't seen in a while. An operation this Israeli reservist, originally from Toronto, will be helping to design. Global News has agreed to only use Maya's first name and not show her face because of the nature of her work. We plan all of the military targets. Um, this is a huge role, as you can imagine, especially dealing with all of the international onlookers and, and, and explaining and also doing everything according to Israeli law as well as international law. Maya was sitting in a synagogue in Vancouver with her husband when the rabbi started to explain that Hamas fighters stormed into Israel, terrorizing communities, taking hostages, and eventually killing more than 1,300 people. Nauseous, sick to my stomach, couldn't even imagine the horrors that, that people had gone through and that people were still going through. She says she's angry to see how some people are reacting to what she views as Israel defending itself. The UN says many women and children have been killed in airstrikes. Maya says Israel takes precautions to warn citizens and minimize the loss of civilian lives. We don't want to kill people, especially not people who are not involved in the situation. We are simply protecting ourselves. But Hamas has also been planning and is likely ready for an all-out assault by Israel, says this security expert. They have been ruling, Hamas, uh, ruling Gaza, and it's a town. They have a town underground um, that they are in control of, not the Israeli army. And undoubtedly, they're setting traps for the Israeli soldiers. Security experts and military strategists anticipate a long and bloody war. We did hear the prime minister say that determination and time will be needed for victory. But Maya is confident they will succeed in their objectives and ensure Israel's security. Donna? Crystal Gamansing in Jerusalem. Thanks, Crystal. Intense diplomatic efforts are underway to try to limit the humanitarian crisis, plus avoid this expanding into a wider conflict in the region. And late today, it was announced the American president, Joe Biden, will travel to the region and is expected to meet with Israel's prime minister. Jackson Prosco is with me from Washington. Jackson, tell us the significance of this trip. Well, Donna, this gives you a sense of the role that the Americans are playing in all this. The announcement about President Biden's visit on Wednesday came after a marathon seven and a half hour long session between U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And it was at the end of that that we heard the announcement that Biden will travel to the region on Wednesday. On the agenda is that Biden will hear personally from the Israelis what their plan is, what their objectives are for the ground invasion of Gaza, as well as what 
what their plan is for minimizing civilian casualties. The U.S. also says it has Israeli agreement to try and open up some sort of humanitarian corridor, try and make sure that aid from other governments and NGOs makes it inside of Gaza, although the specifics still have to be announced there. One thing to keep in mind here is that the visit of a president, of course, is a huge security and logistical problem. It could potentially delay the invasion. Uh, if one does take place in Gaza, it seems unlikely that, that would start while Biden is on the ground. The other thing to keep in mind here, Donna, is that this comes as part of a broader U.S. increase in posture in the region. A second aircraft carrier is on the way to the eastern Mediterranean, and there are reports that as many as 2,000 Marines are also being stationed offshore as a potential rapid reaction force should they be needed at some point. Donna, many developments and more specifics to come out in the days ahead, but certainly a major announcement tonight about the president's looming visit. Lots of moving parts. Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thank you. Beyond the Middle East, there were tense moments for a Canadian military patrol aircraft operating as part of a multinational force in international airspace off the coast of China. Chinese jets intercepted that plane using maneuvers senior military officials describe as aggressive. Global's Nithu Garcha was on board the Canadian plane and explains what happened. A Chinese jet carrying air-to-air -air missiles was doing what Major General Ian Huddleston describes as dangerous maneuvers within close proximity to a Canadian military plane. And they became very, uh, very aggressive and, uh, and to a degree that we would deem it uh, unsafe and unprofessional. He said the Chinese jet also launched multiple flares near the front of the Canadian plane, causing further concern. It happened on Monday in international airspace off the coast of China. This Chinese fighter jet intercepting this Canadian Armed Forces Aurora plane is within a few meters of the wing. It was as close as uh, 10 to 20 feet. Global News was on board the Canadian Aurora aircraft reporting on Operation Neon, part of Canada's contribution to enforce sanctions against North Korea by documenting ships believed to be carrying illegal oil shipments. We're not here acting against the Chinese. We don't want to have anything untoward happen that would, that, that would result in the loss of life. The reason for the aggressive intercepts is unknown. The Canadian crew says They've remained in international waters and are communicating with Chinese pilots, letting them know who they are and what they're doing. I am a Canadian aircraft conducting patrol in support of United Nations Security Council regulations. National Defense Minister Bill Blair called the Chinese military actions unacceptable. Um, I am very concerned that, that the, the unprofessional way in which this was done, it was quite frankly dangerous and reckless and, and put our, our aircraft and their mission at, at, at significant risk, and we will express that to the, the People's Republic of China in the most appropriate way. Canada's military isn't alone in such warnings. Last year, Australia accused the pilot of a Chinese fighter jet of releasing flares and chaff, which include small pieces of aluminum, which entered the Australian aircraft's engine. And in May, the U.S. accused a Chinese fighter jet crew of unnecessarily aggressive behavior during the interception of an American spy plane over the South China Sea. We're flying off their coast. They, uh, they have the right to intercept us, um, but we'd like it to be uh, at all times safe and professional. Nitu Garcha, Global News, Okinawa, Japan. Getting more Canadians out of harm's way. Coming up, Ottawa's plan to withdraw non-essential embassy staff from Israel. The Canadian government has been working to get Canadians in Israel and the West Bank out of the crisis zone. Canadians trapped in Gaza, though, still have no way out. Mackenzie Gray is in Ottawa tonight. Mackenzie. Yeah, Donna, Global News has learned that all non-essential staff from the Canadian Embassy in Israel and their family members have been ordered to leave the country, according to a senior government source. Now, essential staff, including the ambassador, are staying in Tel Aviv to get folks on the Canadian Armed Forces flights to Athens, and there is a big demand for those. 2,300 Canadians want government help to get out of Israel. And earlier today, 21 Canadians were able to get out of the West Bank via a bus into Jordan, and it's expected there'll be more trips in the coming days to get the approximately 230 other other Canadians who've asked for help out of the Palestinian territory. And Mackenzie, the Prime Minister talked today about the need to get those hostages in Gaza out. What else did he have to say? 
Yeah, he started off his remarks in the House of Commons talking about Canada's position on Hamas. They are not freedom fighters. They are not a resistance. They are terrorists. Terrorism is always indefensible, and nothing can justify Hamas's acts of terror and the killing, maiming, and abduction of civilians. But let me also be extremely clear that Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people nor their legitimate aspirations. There'll be more discussions tonight in the House of Commons with a special late night debate on the issue. And the Liberal caucus is also having a late night strategy session on this issue, Donna. All right, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thank you. The federal government has appointed a new special envoy on Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. And know that we will get through this very dark period. Deborah Lyons is a former ambassador to Israel, Afghanistan and the U.S. She'll be tasked with collecting data and speaking out for Jewish people when they're attacked within Canada and abroad. Lyons replaces Erwin Kotler, a former liberal justice minister who held the position for three years. Still ahead, the role of Egypt in this crisis. It lies just south of Gaza. Is it willing to help? Prime Minister Justin Trudeau spoke with the president of Egypt today. Both expressed concerns about the blockade of Gaza and its impact on civilians and agreed on the need for humanitarian relief. Egypt, Israel's neighbor to the south, is trying to de-escalate. Israel and Egypt signed a peace treaty back in 1979 and shared a Nobel Peace Prize for it. Egypt's Anwar Sadat was the first Arab leader to make peace with Israel. Two years later, though, he was assassinated for it. Now there are concerns from Egypt that Gaza's humanitarian crisis could spill over into Egypt. Eric Sorensen reports. It is in Egypt where convoys of trucks stand idle, ready to transport aid. But the area near the border crossing at Rafah was bombed last week by Israeli planes, prompting Egypt to close the crossing. Egypt blames Israel for not reopening it. There is pressure on Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to send in aid and to let foreign nationals out of Gaza. And that's why I prioritised speaking with President Sisi of Egypt early on last week uh, to talk about that and we will continue to do everything we can to alleviate the humanitarian situation on the ground. Egypt said um, we're not going to let uh, foreign nationals out if, you, if, if we can't let aid in. <laughs> Egypt's economy is in dire straits, and President al-Sisi has made it clear Egypt is not prepared to take in what could total hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. Egypt is reluctant to open the gate to a mass influx of Palestinians. Egypt and Israel, the two countries that border Gaza, want to contain the humanitarian crisis in different ways. Egypt does not want things to get worse. It wants to facilitate humanitarian aid into Gaza. And while it will accept some Palestinians, it does not want a flood of refugees into Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. Israel wants to block weapons from being smuggled to Hamas in Gaza, but at the same time is forcing about one million Palestinians to move from northern to southern Gaza, which increases pressure to open the Gaza border into Egypt for more Palestinians. Many Palestinians believe Israel's greater goal is to force them out of Gaza into Egypt. It's in a way uh, another Nakba catastrophe where people are being forcibly ethnically cleansed from uh, the territory. And on another hand, they don't even know where to go because there's nowhere that is safe. Egypt will be central to any negotiation if Israel and Hamas can be persuaded to agree to a ceasefire. The Egyptian government has excellent relations with Israel, uh, but it also has a population that is overwhelmingly uh, uh, supportive of the Palestinians. So there is a very, very delicate tightrope walk here. But a ceasefire is not imminent, and Egypt's worst fear is that the humanitarian crisis will get so bad, Egypt will be inundated with refugees from Gaza. Eric Sorensen, Global News. Seeking safety next, the hundreds of people sheltering in a Catholic church in Gaza. It's been more than three days since Israel warned roughly one million Palestinians in northern Gaza to move south before its ground invasion. But with no safe place to go, many civilians have stayed. And as Heather Yurex West reports, some are taking refuge in Gaza's only Catholic church. 
Words of Catholic prayer for hundreds with no place to go. These images were taken last Wednesday as the Roman Catholic Church of Holy Family in Gaza City began to fill with people seeking shelter from the bombs. Among them, the elderly relatives of a UK member of parliament. They went to seek sanctuary in a church because we're Christian Palestinians. And I'm afraid to say they're still there because they're too old to go. And they say to me that they have nowhere to go. More than two million people live in Gaza. The majority are Muslim. And there are just over 100 Catholics living in Gaza City. But right now, this church is welcoming all. The problem is fuel, water, food, medicine. Um, things are running out. It's been three days since Israel ordered the evacuation of northern Gaza, including Gaza City, with no safe corridors and limited places to go. I asked Father Gabriel, I said, are, are people evacuating? And he said, no, we can't. Um, many of the people, as you'll see in some of the photos, are using wheelchairs, mobility devices, um, some are special needs, tons and tons of children. The church has never come under attack before, but there is no guarantee those gathering here will remain safe. There are no bomb shelters or safe rooms. I texted some of my other friends who live in Gaza City to go to the church and they said it's, it's not safe to get there. The roads around the church are not safe. So few ways to find some semblance of protection. The few options not available to all. Heather Urex West, Global News. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. We leave you tonight with the Western Wall in the old city of Jerusalem, a place of prayer and pilgrimage sacred to the Jewish people and very close to the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the gold-top Dome of the Rock, the third holiest site in Islam. Thanks for watching.